du Conseil de sécurité tenu par visioconférence est ouverte. L'ordre du jour provisoire de la présente séance est la situation au Moyen-Orient. L'ordre du jour est adopté. Conformément à l'article 37 du règlement intérieur provisoire du Conseil, j'invite le représentant de la République arabe syrienne à participer à la présente séance. Il en est ainsi décidé. Conformément à l'article 39 du règlement intérieur provisoire du Conseil, j'invite les intervenants suivants à participer à la présente séance. Monsieur Ger Pedersen, envoyé spécial du secrétaire général pour la Syrie, et Madame Noura Ghazi, avocate spécialisée dans les droits humains et militante. Il en est ainsi décidé. Le Conseil de sécurité va maintenant aborder l'examen du point 2 de l'ordre du jour. Je donne à présent la parole à M. Ger Petersen. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. <clears throat> Last month, I told you how struck I was by the depth of concerns among ordinary Syrians at the current state and the future of their beloved country. A month on, I have heard these messages even louder, including in continued consultations with Syrians participating in the civil society support room and with the Women's Advisory Board. I've heard many of the appeals you are familiar with. The thirst for progress on the 2254 political progress and for an end to all violence and terrorism and a nationwide ceasefire. For actions on detainees and abductees and missing persons and for progress in creating conditions for Syrian refugees and IDPs to return to their homes in a safe, voluntary and dignified manner. I heard a new level of alarm at the dramatic collapse in economic conditions throughout the country. It is easy to understand why. During just one week during the reporting period, the Syrian Lira's market rate depreciated more than in the entire nine years prior, before rallying somewhat. But currency and price volatility remain acute. And the inflation rate has hit peak levels in the past six months. The economic crisis is hitting every part of Syria, regardless of territorial control from Damascus and the southwest, to Aleppo and the Northwest and to the Northeast. Medicine is more expensive and scarce. Food prices have skyrocketed and the supply chains have been disrupted. The purchasing power of ordinary Syrians has seriously diminished as wages, both private and public sector, are vastly inadequate to meet the demands of the day. Mr. President, before the recent deterioration, over 80% of Syrians were estimated to be living below the poverty line. The situation is undoubtedly more severe today, and the intensity of that poverty is likely more acute. The World Food Programme now estimates that some 9.3 million people are food insecure, with over 2 million more at risk. A rise of some 42% in the past year. As World Food Programme Executive Director Beasley recently warned, if this situation deteriorates, famine could well be knocking on the door. Syrian women, the primary breadwinners in many families, are disproportionately affected and forced to shoulder caretaking responsibilities while financially supporting the household. Many women, including those in refugee communities, are facing high risks of exploitation and abuse as they struggle to provide for the day-to-day -day needs of their families. In recent weeks, we have seen many Syrians begin to express new fears, even panic in some quarters, 
We have heard of shops and pharmacies forced to close, unable to cope with the recent volatility, of jobs being lost, of remittances drying up. In some areas of northwest Syria, reports have emerged of locals increasingly using foreign currencies. Mr. President, the decade-long conflict in Syria has wrought destruction on Syria's people, its environment, its infrastructure, and the very fabric of its society, the bonds of trust that underpin any economy. Syria's economic governance has also been characterized by recurrent fiscal and monetary mismanagement and corruption. In recent months, New factors have joined these underlying structural problems, pushing the economy to the brink. The banking crisis in next door Lebanon has had a significant impact. The repercussions all societies and economies have experienced from measures to combat the COVID-19 pandemic have also played their part. Another factor in this context is significant sanctions by the United States and the European Union. These target individuals and entities affiliated with the government and also restrict activity in the financial, banking, oil and gas, and military sectors, as well as exports and multilateral lending to and investments in Syria. Further US secondary sanctions, which have been foreshadowed since the passage of legislation six months ago, will begin entering into force as early as tomorrow, aimed at deterring foreign business activity with the Syrian government. Mr. President, against this backdrop, we have seen some Syrians take peacefully to the streets in a few areas in recent weeks, such as uh, Sweda, Dara, and Idlib, protesting a range of grievances. Moreover, in Syria's southwest, what was said to be a major violent confrontation centered around the town of Tafas has been averted for now with the assistance of Russian mediation. However, we are concerned that there have since been further security incidents and tensions that might result in renewed escalation of violence. This is an area where there are broader geopolitical tensions which appear to be growing more acute. I further note that this month again saw reports of Israeli airstrikes inside Syria. Southern Syria is also an area where ISIL cells appear to remain active. Meanwhile, in the Northwest, the calm brought about by Russia and Turkey is by and large holding. However, we are seeing some worrying signs. Increased mutual shelling, reports of reinforcements on both sides, the first reported pro-government airstrikes in three months, and reports of new civilian displacement. Last week, the extremist Waharid al muminin operations room launched another cross-line attack that resulted in the deaths of several Syrian soldiers. Two of its leaders were subsequently killed in a U.S. drone strike on 14 June. It and other small extremist factions have now formed a new operations room, a likely harbinger for future attacks. I have been assured by both Russia and Turkey that they are working to contain the situation and sustain the calm. And I note that there has been further progress in Russian-Turkish cooperation on the work of joint patrols on the ground. Mr. President, I continue to appeal for calm to be sustained in Idlib and elsewhere and for a nationwide ceasefire in line with Resolution 2254. I underscore the importance of addressing the challenge posed by listed terrorist groups through a cooperative, targeted and effective approach that safeguards stability, protects civilians and fully respects international humanitarian law. The same is true regarding efforts to prevent ISIL resurgence whose attacks continued in and around the central desert. Mr. President, 
I'm ready to convene and facilitate a third session of the Syrian-led and Syrian-owned Constitutional Committee. Conscious that global travel restrictions remain in place, I am hopeful that a session in Geneva may be possible towards the end of August. But obviously, the realities facing the Syrian people cannot be solely addressed by discussing the Constitution. And the Syrian parties will face great difficulties in resolving serious problems without real diplomacy among the key international players with influence. After all, there are still five international armies operating across the country and active measures by many countries as regards Syria. There are real and substantive differences among those international players, as there are between the Syrian parties. Indeed, we have seen the depth of these differences in debates over sanctions in recent weeks, and we continue to see it in competing assessments regarding the political will of different actors to work to resolve the conflict. These issues are not going to be resolved by positioning. They need to be subject of real, they need to be the subject of real discussions and diplomacy. Unlocking progress will need mutual and reci reciprocal steps on the basis of clear understandings by the Syrian parties and by international partners. I am convinced that there are common interests on which to build such a diplomacy. And there is a common stated commitment to advance Resolution 2254 and supporting the Syrian-led, Syrian-owned, UN-facilitated political process. <clears throat> Let me also reiterate, at this critical time, the Secretary General's emphasis on the importance of full, sustained, and unimpeded humanitarian access, using all modalities including scaled-up cross-line and cross-border access. Humanitarian access remain imperative, not only given the increasing suffering of the Syrian people, but also given that there is still a risk from COVID-19 pandemic. Syria now has reported 183 cases in total. Mr. President, meanwhile, I reiterate my appeal for the Syrian government and all other Syrian parties to carry out large-scale and unilateral releases of detainees and abductees, especially of women, children, the elderly and the sick, and for more meaningful actions on missing persons. The COVID-19 pandem pandemic is still a risk and should serve as an extra impetus for such action, as it has in other countries. Mr. President, Syria is going through a time of great flux. Nobody involved in the conflict should presume that time is on their side. Nobody should be sure there will be better openings down the road. What is required is the readiness of all to deal seriously with the realities of the conflict. Guided by Resolution 2254, with your support, I will continue to work with the Syrian parties and all international stakeholders to facilitate a way forward that addresses all features and outcomes of the conflict, that restores the sovereignty, unity, independence, and territorial integrity of Syria, that ends the acute suffering of the Syrian people and that enables them to shape their own future. Thank you, Mr. President. Je remercie Monsieur Peterson pour son exposé. Je donne à présent la parole à Madame Noura Gadzi. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Special Envoy of Syria, distinguished representative of, of the state, I got very confused when the French presidency of the Security Council kindly invited me to attend this meeting, because how in 10 minutes can I describe the suffering of a people and a country continuous for 10 years now? I am definitely very proud to reach this place. Now, my life passes in front of me 
as a short film showing all the deprivation and loss I suffered as a result of my resistance to tyranny and injustice. But at the same time, I feel that I am facing a difficult test before the eyes of the world. Will my presence really constitute an addition to finding a solution to the issue of detainees and the forcibly disappeared in Syria? Or will, be, or will be I used as a tool to highlight the human face of the international community, which unfortunately has always failed to, admo to advocate just the humanitarian issues? I was brought up during my childhood and adolescence on the stories of the struggle of peoples in the world, in Africa, Latin America, and the Arab world, for issues of enforced disappearance and arbitrary detention that resulted from authoritarian and, ra and racist practices. I am not here to talk about myself or my suffering as a daughter and as a wife. I do not have any personal attitude towards anyone or any party. Despite all my suffering and the harder price I paid in my personal and professional life. Because hatreds have no place in human rights work, and this is what our opponents do not understand. Today, I am trying to summarize in my briefing the story of a homeland and address in my words ethical and humanitarian issue and certainly historical. Right here and now, I am talking to you about the suffering of tens of thousands of families of missing, forcibly disappeared and detainees, women in particular, along this geographical area closest to my heart, Syria. I specify women for many reasons. Probably the most important one is that they are the direct victims of these flagrant violations of human rights in the enforced disappearance of their male loved ones in the most horrific ways. Of course, this does not make me exclude women themselves as detainees forcibly disappeared and missing. But as you know, most of those who, who's, who disappeared and arrested are men. This has left women alone struggling with all the hardships of life and feelings of loss alone, taking care of their families alone, and fighting for this country and for knowing the truth of the absence of their loved ones alone. We, Syrian women, struggle to know the fate of our loved ones and demand justice for them, for us, and for our country. So we established many families association, and I am proud of being a founding member of one of them, Families for Freedom Movement. I am also proud that I have succeeded with my team in No Photo Zone or organization, which I direct, in not discriminating against the families of detainees and the forcibly disappeared on any political basis or on the basis of the party that arrested or hid their loved ones. Rather, we gathered hundreds of these families, despite everyone who wanted to separate us. Pain, suffering, and purpose unite us. We want our loved ones. We want justice, and the beginning of knowing the truth will lead us to it. Perhaps the most prominent reason that causes our suffering to continue is the absence of an international political will to stop it. According to many international organizations, there are tens of thousands of detainees forcibly disappeared and missing persons in Syria since the outbreak of the protest started in March 2011. One of our priority demands in this protest was to release the detainees. But the result was that we were met with killing and arrest. Violence led to more violence throughout Syria until we become unable now to count the number of our victims and the names of our opponents who violate our rights every day. Detention, enforced disappearance, and torture have become committed by many parties, and the world views the conflict between a dictatorial regime and extremist factions, turning a blind eye to our existence as nonviolent activists who reject everyone commits violence and injustice through the means of our nonviolent resistance. There are thousands of innocent women and children in detention centers. Hundreds of mothers arrested with their children and children born inside detention centers. All those arrested were accused of being terrorists, even though they have no fault except that they reject injustice. And possibly they didn't interfere in any act against the authorities, but were arrested simply 
because of their belonging to regions enraged these authorities, or as hostages because of the activism of their relatives opposed to the regime. Does anyone here believe that there is a political system that hates and gets anger at certain regions? And I kindly ask you here to review the development indicators in Syria before 2011. Allow me to express my rejection and the rejection of those I represent for all prisoners exchange deals that take place between the fighting parties, which we do not belong to any of them. Our detainees are not prisoners of war. They are arbitrarily detained persons, and the central government uses them as leverage and for achieving gains. Prisoners exchange deals are nothing but blackmail for us. We want a radical, comprehensive, and fair solution for all the detainees and disappeared in Syria, not only for a part of them. Today, I am talking about violations of laws by the Syrian regime, not only the international laws, but also the Syrian ones, for most among them, the current Syrian constitution. I defend the Syrian law itself against all those who violate it, break it, and despise it. Aren't the exceptional courts, particularly the military field court and the terrorism court, a violation of the principles of fair trials stipulated in the Syrian and international laws? Aren't summary executions a flagrant violation of the human and the prisoner's rights? Isn't torture really a crime in all laws and under all circumstances? There are daily examples of the violations of the Syrian constitution by those who promote that they are its guardians. Mr. President, we are the protectors of the Constitution. We do not have military force. Our weapon is the law, and our opponent violates the law. Is it not obvious to the world who violate laws in Syria? Imagine the death of one of your loved ones. Imagine how to prepare for a grand funeral for his farewell, wearing the most beautiful clothes, conducting condolence ceremony, and putting the most beautiful flowers on his grave. We are deprived of this area for our loved ones. We want to live the morning as every human being on this earth is entitled to, and we want to close our open wounds. I hope to complete here everything that I have done for the issues of detainees and the disappeared. I bring messages to you from hundreds of women whom I represent. Those women demand to reveal the fate of their loved ones, where a death certificate as a paper containing a date and fictitious cause of death is not sufficient for them. Dear all, the whole world unites in his fear of the coronavirus disease. So at the very least, why we do not unite on the will to make a decision to protect detainees in Syria prisons from this virus which places them at double risk? Our demands are simple and clear to the world. We Syrians, want application of laws and accountability for those who violate them and call us traitors because of our demands. Should we have to submit to injustice and tyranny in order not to be called as traitors? I am not a traitor and not a submissive. I belong to Syria, the land, the people and the state as other Syrians. Yes, a state. The state that the Syrian regime violates it through unfair practices towards all of its legislative, judicial, and executive authorities. The state that defined by the Constitution as the people and the land and the authority. How can I be against my state? I believe that because of my love for the state, I contend with the regime that robbed the authority of their independence and subjected the people and the land to it. We are a people belong to our state, protected and defend it against a security political system that robs the country every day. Excuse me, I cannot end without saying what my heart is urging me to mention, which is the peaceful protest in Sweda, south of Syria, and the arrest of 10 activists by the Syrian authorities du during the protest yesterday, who belong to a, to a minority that the regime claims to protect, and he cannot accuse them of being terrorists and he knows the reason. Finally, I hope that I succeeded to communicating my messages to the world, the message that I will be always ready to pay the highest price for it. Thank you for taking the time to hear me 
And thanks again to the French Presidency of the Security Council for inviting me. And may we all have a fair and a free world. Je remercie euh, Madame Ghazi euh, pour son exposé. Je donne maintenant la parole aux membres du Conseil qui souhaitent faire une déclaration. Et je donne à présent la parole à la représentante des États-Unis. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you for your briefing. Thank you, Gear. And Nora, thank you so much for, for reminding us that we must not turn a blind eye. And may I express my sincere gratitude for your informative comments on such a very dear topic to me. The United States reiterates its call for the Assad regime to immediately release the thousands of civilians being held arbitrarily in detention centers, where, as we've noted before, crowded and inhumane conditions significantly increase the risk of a rapid spread of COVID-19. Equally important is progress on the Constitutional Committee, whose stakeholders have agreed on the agenda, but have not met in recent months because of the regime's co-chair's unwillingness to convene virtually. Special Envoy Peterson, we welcome your announcement of the agreement of the opposition and regime to convene the Constitutional Committee in August. Last week, Syrian and Russian airstrikes in Idlib and northwestern Hama and caused the largest disruption of the Idlib ceasefire agreement since it was established by Turkey and Russia on March the 5th. The United States condemns these acts of violence by Syria and Russia and provocations by terrorist groups on the ground for violating the ceasefire. We call for an immediate end to airstrikes by the regime and Russia, and we urge Moscow and Damascus to recommit to an enduring, verifiable, nationwide ceasefire. Maintaining the ceasefire in northwest Syria is absolutely vital for the achievement of a political solution to this conflict, and it is essential for the work of the Special Envoy and the full implementation of Resolution 2254. Once again, we reiterate our call for the United Nations to be at the center of efforts to formalize the Idlib ceasefire under UN auspices in accordance with UN Envoy Peterson's call for a nationwide ceasefire. This call is in line with Resolution 2254's demands to establish a nationwide ceasefire and for the UN Special Envoy to monitor the lines of contact to ensure that the ceasefire is upheld. The United States is resolute in our commitment to reaching a political solution to the Syrian conflict. We will continue to reject any attempt by the Assad regime and its allies to use military force, obstruction, or disinformation to bypass UN efforts to restore peace in Syria. The recent violations of the Idlib ceasefire remind us of just how fragile the political process is and consequently how important it is to deny the Assad regime and its allies a military victory in its nearly decade-long war against the Syrian people. To that end, tomorrow, the Trump administration will take decisive steps to prevent the Assad regime from securing a military victory and to steer the regime and its allies back toward Special Envoy Peterson and the UN-led political process. Our aim is to deprive the Assad regime of the revenue and the support it has used to commit the large-scale atrocities and human rights violations that prevent a political resolution and severely diminish the prospects for peace. The mandatory sanctions provided for in the Caesar Syrian Civilian Protection Act of 2019 are aimed at deterring bad actors who continue to aid and finance the Assad regime's atrocities against the Syrian people while simply enriching themselves and their families. 
The Caesar le legislation contains strong provisions to ensure humanitarian assistance is not in any way impacted by the legislation. It also outlines requirements for the suspension of the Caesar Act sanctions on Syria, including ending all brazen attacks towards its people and holding all perpetrators accountable. The Assad regime has a clear choice to make. Pursue the political path established in Resolution 2254, or leave the United States with no other choice but to continue withholding reconstruction funding and impose sanctions against the regime and its financial backers. I want to focus with a few words on July the 10th, 23 days away, when the Council deliberates on the mandate renewal of the Humanitarian Cross-Border Mechanisms, Resolution 2504, impact the UN-led process. The simple truth is that there will be no end to the humanitarian crisis in Syria until there is a political solution. We cannot use the July 10th mandate renewal negotiations to shape the political realities on the ground. Our job, above all others, is to uphold the highest humanitarian ideals and do the most good for the vulnerable people around the world. As the political process remains in its early stages, we must ensure humanitarian aid flows to the Syrian people based on their needs. That means humanitarian aid must not be used as a bargaining chip. Millions of people depend on UN assistance across all parts of Syria. Therefore, every member of this council must ensure every Syrian in need of aid is reached by cross-border and cross-line assistance through the most direct routes. For the millions of women, men, and children in Northeast and Northwest Syria, those are the most direct routes, UN authorized cross-border points of Baba Hawa, Baba Salam, and Al Yarabiya. The Assad regime has a choice to make, but so does this council. And I want to say today that we cannot choose through inaction or gridlock to starve civilians, deny them shelter, and allow COVID-19 to spread as tactics, reaching a political solution. We cannot turn a blind eye, as Nora said. Supporting the continuation of UN cross-border access to as many people as possible, regardless of who controls the territory, is just as important as supporting Special Envoy Peterson's efforts to achieve a political end to this conflict. Thank you. Je remercie euh, la représentante euh, des États-Unis euh, pour son intervention et je donne à présent la parole au représentant de la Fédération de Russie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Nicolas. I have a feeling that uh, some mics are not uh, muted. Could you ask, please, colleagues, just to check it uh, uh, for the sake of uh, hearing me well? Господин председатель, мы благодарим господина Педерсона за брифинг, выслушали Нуру Гази. Как нас информировал спецпосланник, он продолжает контакт с сирийскими сторонами в интересах проведения третьего заседания Конституционного комитета в Женеве, как только позволит ограничение вызвано мировой пандемии. Мистер Президент, мы благодарим Гейр Педерсон за его брифинг, и мы слушали мисс Нуру Гази. Я думаю, это будет только справедливо, что когда в следующий раз мы обсуждаем политику Сирии, to invite uh, also a representative from the civil society within Syria and to hear their stories about their suffering uh, under the yoke of terrorists, uh, under the foreign occupation, under bombings. Uh, war, is a, war is a very cruel thing. Uh, nine, nine years of war brought indeed terrible suffering for all the Syrian people, whether they are abroad or whether they are within Syria. As the special envoy informed us he continues contacts with the Syrian parties with the aim of holding the third meeting of the Constitutional Committee in Geneva. 
as soon as restrictions caused by the global pandemic allow. There are some blueprints for dates, and the Syrian parties demonstrate will and readiness for the dialogue on the basis of the agreed agenda. We support efforts of the Special Envoy. For our part, we will continue to promote inter-Syrian dialogue, both in national capacity and together with Turkey and Iran within the framework of the Astana format that has proved its effectiveness. At the same time, we remind that this is a Syrian-owned and Syrian-led process. External interference in imposing foreign agenda should be prevented. In the Idlib de-escalation zone, a ceasefire is generally respected and joint Russian-Turkish patrols continue. However, terrorists continue provocative actions and attacks, including those that kill Turkish troops. Uh, my U.S. colleague appealed to, uh, to Russia and Syria uh, on the ceasefire but I would appeal to her to listen uh, who the violators of the ceasefire are, which was uh, uh, quoted, by the way, by Gail Pedersen himself. There was an attempt to seize several settlements, uh, but Syrian government forced, forces managed to repel those attacks. All this once again proves that Idlib is controlled by terrorists. We hope that our Turkish partners will fulfill their obligations uh, to neutralize these elements. At the same time, we will not allow rebranding of Hiyat Tahrir Rasham into the moderate opposition, quote-unquote, which some are trying to promote. In recent months, terrorists have intensified their activities in other parts of the country, primarily to the east of Euphrates. ISIS uh, attacked Kurdish units, militants escaped from prisons, and nothing is being done to improve the situation in the al Khor refugee camp, as well as in the Attan Feria and the Rukban camp. We presume that achievement of stability and security in those areas is possible only if the control of a legitimate government is restored. For those who demand that Damascus implement Security Council Resolution 2254, we remind first lines of this resolution, respect for sovereignty, independence, unity, and territorial integrity of Syria. We propose to start from the beginning and implement this paragraph, first of all, first and foremost. In this regard, we stress the need of finding solutions to Syrian problems through inclusive dialogue and putting an end to foreign occupation. This will also allow and contribute to the return of Syrian refugees to their homes. After being suspended due to the coronavirus restrictions, the process of their return resumed. The Syrian authorities are taking all necessary measures to accommodate returnees, as well as preventing the spread of pandemic. Mr. President, Attempts to play with terrorists, use them for their own for own purposes, is just one proof of how the situation in Syria is politicized. We are convinced that all Security Council meetings on Syria, in fact, have a political connotation. Because the so-called chemical and humanitarian dossiers has been just become just a tool of pressure on Damascus. The humanitarian assistance to Syria is one of the clearest examples of political blackmail that we see from some of colleagues when discussing humanitarian access to government territories and to areas beyond Damascus control. We will discuss this in the coming days. We were appalled by an attack on the WFP humanitarian convoy in Lebanon, which was intended for Syria. In Lebanese city of Tripoli, several trucks were attacked and burned by locals locals due to suspicions that it was smuggling Lebanese goods. Tomorrow, the so-called uh, Caesar bill will enter into force in the United States. U.S. officials, as we heard today, proudly boast that it is because of their sanctions that the economic situation of the Syrian people has become so complicated. By this, they recognize that sanctions imposed allegedly, allegedly against the Syrian leadership in fact hit ordinary people. This uh, is being said openly that uh, the purpose of these measures is to overthrow the legitimate authorities of Syria. In late May, the EU also extended unilateral sanctions against Damascus. We have repeatedly said that this is not only this not only cripples the country's economy, but also hinders humanitarian assistance to people. Advertised exemptions do not work. This is confirmed by the humanitarian workers themselves. Mr. President, uh, regrettably, the UN is also used for political purposes. I mean the Board of Inquiry for the Northwest of Syria. Despite the fact that we do not consider the creation of the board to be legitimate, the Russian Ministry of Defense, on an exceptional basis, examined the summary of its report and conducted its own investigation. 
We have repeatedly denied accusations that Russian air forces attacked civilian targets. We held a special press conference at the UN on September 16 uh, last year, exactly 10 months ago, and presented photo proofs. This information was ignored because the political order to put pressure on Russia must carry on. Unfortunately, it has become a usual business to reply to rely on unverified false data and banal fakes. First of all, the problem is in the sources of information. We are well aware why these sources are carefully hidden. They are always opponents of the Syrian authorities and masters of staged chemical attacks. At the same time, the methodology for collecting evidence, so-called evidence, is always the same. Social networks, remote interviews with witnesses who actually live in European Western capitals, Photoshop, and my favorite one, favorite one, the most ridiculous, intercepts of pilot exchanges. For their part, the Russian military physically visited the sites of alleged strikes and were able to inspect the buildings and make photographs. One site is located on the territory of terrorists for the time being, so we only have satellite and reconnaissance imagery. Evidence of our Ministry of Defense proves that the sites were not subject to air or artillery strikes. At the same time, the Nayab, Nairab Palestinian refugee camp was indeed shelled by militants with civilian casualties. Our mission has, has these photos as well as eyewitness testimonies. We do not hide their names because they are real people who give true te testimonies. Analysis of the summary of the report leads to one more conclusion. The deconflicting mechanism has more than just gaps, to put it mildly, but it is used for misinformation. Because of false data, a special UN board was created. As if we were coming back to test tubes, uh, to test tubes with alleged Iraqi chemical weapons. Some deconflicted, so-called deconflicted object, objects, did not actually correspond to the declared status. And some buildings were used by militants, militants as headquarters. We handed all of those proofs to the Secretary General. We are ready to present these documents to all parties concerned. But I wonder whether you will be interested to study them. I thank you, Mr. President. Je remercie euh, le représentant de la Fédération de Russie euh, pour sa déclaration et je passe à présent la parole au représentant de la Chine. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, let me start by thanking Special Envoy Patterson for his briefing. Indeed, we benefit greatly from his thorough comprehensive report today. I also wish to thank for uh, his tireless efforts in these difficult circumstances. We have also t taken note of the briefing by Ms. Ghazi. Mr. President, with regard to the political process concerning the Syrian issue, it's China's consistent position to support the Syrian-led, Syrian-owned political process. We understand that COVID-19 has caused additional difficulties for the political process. Meanwhile, it's also our firm belief that the political process should not stop under any circumstances. We appreciate the efforts made by the Special Envoy, and we also encourage him to make more efforts in promoting substantive political dialogue and promote mutual trust among parties concerned. We are glad to hear that the Constitutional Committee will hold its third round in Geneva by the end of August, and we are willing to see more progress through this round of consultation. We also hope that the Secretary General and the Special Envoy Patterson's call on ceasefire will be responded positively. Facing a window of opportunity to promote inclusive dialogue and a political solution, we cannot overstate the importance that the Syrian parties must strengthen consultation 
within the Constitutional Committee and engage constructively with the UN Special Envoy. Other relevant parties should also play a positive role in jointly addressing the challenges faced by the Syrian people. With regard to the pandemic situation, we note that there are some new confirmed cases in Syria, and the Syrian government is taking effective measures in fighting COVID-19. Meanwhile, the international community should intensify cooperation with the people and the government of Syria in combating the virus. China has donated medical supplies to the Syrian Ministry of Health earlier this month, and we are ready to continue offering our support and help. At this difficult time, it's imperative for the international community, UN agencies, and countries in the region to cooperate with the Syrian government in the fight against uh, uh, COVID-19 and the lessen the sufferings of the people of the country. We are deeply concerned by recent reports of the economic situation in Syria. Years of economic blockade have caused the tremendous hardships to the Syrian people, in particular women and children. The sufferings caused by devaluation of the Syrian currency and soaring prices of commodities, including food, fall heavily upon civilians across the country. We have heard the reports from Special Envoy Patterson about the poverty situation and about the possible famine in this country, and we are very much concerned about that. We urge the United States to respond actively to the urgent appeal of the Secretary General and the Special Envoy and to lift unilateral sanctions immediately. What is even more worrying is that new rounds of sanctions will be imposed against Syria. These sanctions will inevitably further hinder the economic and the social development of Syria, as well as the livelihoods of ordinary Syrians. As vulnerable countries like Syria are struggling with the pandemic, imposing more sanctions is simply inhuman and may cause additional catastrophes. The United Nations especially OCHA, should pay more attention on the negative impact of sanctions on humanitarian conditions of the Syrian people. Some colleagues are talking about the human rights situation there. If they do care about the real human rights of the Syrian people, they should take real actions in responding to the urgent calls of the Secretary General and his special envoy. We should recognize and acknowledge that relevant parties are making great efforts to maintain ceasefire and promote stability in Syria. Meanwhile, the international community should be alerted again, uh, against and must not allow the fact that terrorists are seeking to take advantage of the current situation. The Security Council should attach importance to this issue and support the Special Envoy's call for effective, cooperative, and targeted counterterrorism efforts. We also call on relevant parties to launch negotiations and take actions on counterterrorism. Mr. President, the future of Syria must be decided by the Syrians without foreign interference. It's fundamental to respect and uphold the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Syria. China will continue to support the good offices of the Special Envoy in fulfilling his mandate endorsed by Security Council Resolution 2254. I thank you, Mr. President. Je remercie le représentant de la Chine pour sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant de la République dominicaine. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. I would also like 
I thank Mr. Pedersen for his briefing. And I would also like to thank Ms. Gals for lending her voice to the families of the thousands of Syrians that have gone missing over years of conflict. Whether detained or dead, families have the right to know the whereabouts of their loved ones. The COVID-19 pandemic can be both a challenge of potential unprecedented scale for the Syrian people, but also an opportunity to enhance our solidarity to those most vulnerable. A year ago, the Security Council was united in adopting Resolution 2474 on missing persons in armed conflict. With it, the Council underscored that the steps set out therein can, be, can contribute to the process of confidence building between parties to armed conflict. In the Syrian context, with more than 90,000 reportedly gone missing since the start of the conflict, achieving more progress on the humanitarian release of detainees could be the first step in a national trust building effort that could eventually constitute the cornerstone for a broader process in which Syrians are reconciled. The promotion of the truth, justice, and accountability and the fight against impunity must be advocated for, with no rest, so that those responsible pay the price of their acts. Therefore, this Council has the responsibility to continue to demand more and meaningful actions on the release of detainees and the provision of information about the missing to their families. Mr. President, the deteriorating living conditions of Syrians is a source of great concern for the Dominican Republic. The convergence of a humanitarian crisis, an economic crisis, and a potential, potential public health is undermining the capacity of the Twitter Adding to the list of concern is the worrying signs of resurgence and regrouping of ISIS in the region. They are attacking civilians and security forces and terrorizing farmers and destroying their livelihoods and infrastructure. All these conditions reiterate the repressing need to continue to push for a definitive and substantial political solution to the conflict. I say it again, a political solution. One that helps Syrians build, rebuild and relaunch their country on the basis of the rule of law of peace and security for all its citizens. In fairness and inequality. <clears throat> Mr. President, to conclude the Dominican Republic rhetoric, the need for a long lasting national ceasefire all parties and those who support them must commit to this and allow some sense of security to the suffering population, particularly in the Northwest. Two, the importance of, importance of facilitating safe and unimpeded access to serve the needs of all those in need, particularly in the COVID, in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic and the persistence of pressing needs all across the country. And three, that there is no military solution to this conflict, but one based on a negotiated settlement led and owned by the Syrians <clears throat> and facilitated by the UN as outlined in Resolution 2254. And that the Constitutional Committee can indeed be a door opener for a broader political process. Therefore, parties need to continue their consultation as soon as the conditions are there to do so. <clears throat> and finally, Mr. President, the government of Syria needs to show credible and renewed commitment to the broad political process with words and with actions. And building upon this commitment, create the conditions for free and fair elections next year it is now in its hand, on its hand to move forward and meet the aspirations of the people of Syria, including those living as refugees. 
a sustainable solution to this conflict will only emerge from the determined commitment of all parties to the peace and prosperity of the Syrian people as its main objective. I thank you. Je remercie euh, le représentant de la République dominicaine pour sa déclaration et je passe à présent la parole à la représentante de Saint-Vincent et des Grenadines. Thank you, Mr. President. I would also like to thank Ms. Gazi and Special Envoy Peterson for their briefings. St. Vincent and the Grenadines continues to support the Special Envoy's efforts to facilitate the wider political process in Syria. The creation of a safe and neutral environment which cultivates trust and cooperation is vital to the progress and success of the political process. In this regard, the March ceasefire agreement, although fragile, has created an opportunity for further meaningful engagement. It is our hope that this agreement will also encourage the full implementation of a lasting nationwide cessation of hostilities. We take note that the small body of the Constitutional Committee is keen to proceed with its next session whenever the global situation allows. The Committee must maintain its momentum despite the current circumstances. We therefore encourage the recommencement of the important work in as far as it is practicable to do so remotely. To foster goodwill, we reiterate the need for constructive action on the issue of detainees particularly in consideration of the COVID-19 pandemic. The fate of missing persons must also be clarified. Syria's socio-economic situation continues to deteriorate to the detriment of the Syrian people. We echo the appeal for the lifting of unilateral sanctions to alleviate the burden and to assist in strengthening the country's capacity to confront the pandemic. Mr. President, we continue to encourage the international community to contribute to Syria's reconstruction. The restoration of critical infrastructure is integral to the improvement of the humanitarian situation and is a necessary component for the safe, dignified and voluntary return of refugees and internally displaced persons. The presence of Security Council designated terrorist entities continues to pose a substantial threat we underscore the need for a collaborative approach to counter-terrorism counter efforts, which must comply with international law. At the same time, we emphasize that full respect for Syria's sovereignty, unity, and territorial integrity dictates the withdrawal of all unauthorized foreign forces. Mr. President, Syria's only viable path towards peace is through a credible, balanced, and inclusive political process that is free from interference and reflects the legitimate aspirations of the Syrian people. The international community must therefore continue to lend its support to ensure that the goals of Resolution 2254 are realized. Thank you, Mr. President. Je remercie la représentante de Saint-Vincent et les Grenadines et je passe à présent La parole au représentant du Niger. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Let me begin by thanking Special Envoy Pedersen and Mrs. Noura Ghazi for their insightful presentation. Madame Ghazi, we heard your heartfelt cry of distress. I would also like to welcome His Excellency Bashar al Jafari permanent representative of Syria for joining us this morning. Mr. President, Niger would like to reaffirm that the solution to the Syrian conflict cannot be pursued by the only military action. While we welcome the decrease in violence since the Turkey-Russia sponsored ceasefire, we believe that the cessation of hostilities must go in tandem with the revival of the political process. We should not afford watching the crisis getting more and more enshrined and the suffering of innocent and vulnerable population being prolonged. There is an urgent need to make progress in the path to a political solution to the Syrian conflict. To this respect, allow me to touch upon the following points 
which we believe are the cornerstones of an inclusive and lasting solution to this pro pro protracted crisis. First, securing a comprehensive national ceasefire as called by the Special Envoy and Secretary General is crucial at this moment when the COVID-19 pandemic, which requires that all parties to focus on containing and mitigating its impact on the population already living under dire living conditions. We note with concern the reports that indicate escalations in Jebel al zawiya area of Idlib and in northwestern Hana after we have observed many months of, uh, of few hostilities and call on all parties to de-escalate and stop the hostilities. Second, my delegation calls upon all the stakeholders to return to the negotiation table and in good faith. Niger supports the effort deployed by the special envoy in engaging with the different parties on the Constitutional Committee in a bid to revitalizing its work. The United Nations must lend all necessary support to this process while preserving the leadership and ownership of the concerned Syrian parties of the process in keeping with the provisions of the Security Council Resolution 2254. We especially call on the Syrian government to further announce its engagement with the other parties to the talks. Third, confidence building measures from both sides could greatly help diffuse mistrust between the negotiating parties in the political process. We would like, therefore, to echo the call of the special envoy Pedersen on May 18th that a large scale and unilateral releases of detainees as well as more meaningful actions on the cases of missing persons have never been more needed. Both sides should show compassion in these unprecedented times by ensuring medical care for all detainees and in giving deserved clarification to the families the of the missing persons. Fourth, the call for a ceasefire and the need for a common and collective effort in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic should not distract us from the fights against terrorism, especially as evidence shows that criminal groups are trying to take advantage of the current health crisis to regroup and resume service. The Syrian government has the right to continue the fights against terrorism on its territory, yet it must be done in compliance with international human rights and international humanitarian laws, especially with regard to the protection of civilians and civilian infrastructures. Lastly, and not the least, we should remain aware that in view of the recent pro protest fueled by economic hardships in some south southern provinces, hitherto spared by the instability, having a constitution alone and eventually the holding of elections are not the panacea to ending the crisis. Economic measures and well thought peace building efforts must be worked out and implemented as well. Talking about the economic hardships of Syrians, we should not also lose sight of the fact that oftentimes when a conflict is protracted, as is seen elsewhere, the natural resources of the country that should normally benefit the population are illegally exploited and looted by diverse actors while the conflict is ongoing. The principle of the sovereignty of populations over their natural resources should be observed. To conclude, Mr. President, my delegation would like once again to express our appreciations to Mr. Pedersen for his uh, uh, relenting efforts in engaging with Syrian stakeholders from all sides, including the Women Advisory Board and civil society organization across Syria and the region. We expect to see the political process resume in earnest as the current restrictions due to the COVID-19 are being lifted around the globe. Je vous remercie, Monsieur le Président. Je remercie le représentant du Niger pour sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant du Royaume-Uni.
Merci, Monsieur le Président. Um, Mr. President, I'd like to begin um, by once again thanking the Special Envoy um, for his briefing and, and thank you also to Ms. Noura Ghazi for joining us today and for her heartfelt um, yet clear-eyed appeals for justice. Uh, we felt the pain you expressed on behalf of so many Syrians. Thank you. We remain deeply concerned at the security situation in northwest Syria, and we welcome the 5th of March ceasefire agreed between Russia and Turkey, which brought a vital period of relative calm to the northwest and allowed some of the million people displaced during the regime and Russian offensive at the beginning of this year to start returning to their homes. But recent weeks have seen fierce fighting between extremists and regime forces, and in recent days, we are concerned to hear reports of renewed Russian airstrikes, some of which caused civilian casualties on the 8th of June and prompted others to flee. The UK fully supports the request of the UN Special Envoy and Secretary General for a lasting cessation of hostilities in the northwest and throughout Syria. At this council and the, uh, at this council and the UN have repeatedly warned a continued escalation in fighting would have catastrophic consequences for the 3 million Syri Syrian civilians in the Northwest. We urge all parties to show restraint and to redouble efforts to work together and with the Secretary General and his special envoy to find a political solution, Polit particularly at a time when COVID-19 poses a severe threat in a country already weakened by conflict. As we agreed unanimously in Resolution 2254, and have reiterated many times since, the only sustainable solution to the crisis in Syria is through an inclusive and Syrian-led political process that meets the legitimate aspirations of the Syrian people. And yet, despite this unanimous agreement, the Syrian regime, aided and abetted by a permanent member of this council, has ignored Resolution 2254 and continue to subjugate, subjugate the interests of the Syrian people to its pursuit of a military solution. The devastating effect of this policy on the Syrian people and the Syrian economy are increasingly clear and compounded, as we heard from Mr. Peterson, by global factors. The collapsing economy in Syria is exacerbating the plight of civilians in all parts of the country, while COVID-19 and the problems of the Lebanese economy are clearly important contributory factors. The main cause for the state of the Syrian economy remains the years of conflict, corruption and mismanagement by this regime. Unless the regime resolves to engage genuinely in political dialogue, to focus on reform and address the legitimate concerns and aspirations of the Syrian people, there will be no sustainable solution. While the crisis intensifies, the UK continues to support OCHA and the World Health Organization in providing life-saving assistance to those who need it most. Whilst the cross-border aid mechanism is a temporary measure to achieve this, the Secretary General has made clear in his report that there is not yet any alternative, either in the Northwest or the Northeast. It is with this in mind that UN Security Council Resolution 2504 must be renewed for a further 12 months and cross-border assistance into the Northeast must be reauthorized. We note that last week, Assad sacked his Prime Minister and at the end of May, he appointed a new set of governors. No doubt, to give the impression that he is doing something to address the problems facing Syria and his failure to deal with them. But that is not what Syrians have been calling for. What they need and what they deserve is a better Syria. And for the concerns and grievances that brought them into the streets in 2011 to be addressed. It's in this connection that we greatly commend the work of Nuragazi for the rights of the families of the detained. We have discussed time and again at these council sessions the need for the regime to engage properly on the detainees' file. Limited prisoner swaps are not enough. We urge the regime to make widespread releases of political prisoners and vulnerable people and to ensure medical care is available for those still in detention. 
This is all the more important given the threat posed by COVID-19. We are proud that the UK is able to support Nora's work through the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Finally, Mr. President, we have heard criticism again today of sanctions against the Syrian regime. The way to achieve the removal of these sanctions is clear. Rather than interfering with aid, bombing schools and hospitals, and detaining and torturing its people, the regime must heed the cause of its population and engage seriously with Special Envoy Pedersen and the UN-led political process to achieve a peaceful end to the conflict. As we say again, goods and medical supplies used for humanitarian purposes are not subject to EU sanctions, which the, EU, which the UK continues to apply, and additional exemptions from sanctions are available for humanitarian activity in Syria. And I would note again that the UK and our European partners are among the leading donors to humanitarian aid to Syria, including in regime-held areas. Thank you, Mr. President. Je remercie le représentant du Royaume-Uni pour sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant de l'Indonésie. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président, we thank Special Envoy Gap Pedersen and Ms. Nura Ghazi for their briefings. As mentioned by the Special Envoy, the current situation in Syria is indeed very challenging with the social economic impacts of COVID-19 and the prolonged humanitarian condition due to the Syrian crisis. Clearly, there is no magic bullet in solving all of these challenges overnight. Strong commitment from the Syrian parties to remain engaged in a constructive dialogue is imperative as part of the step-by-step -step efforts in addressing various issues in Syria. And respecting a nationwide ceasefire is key to be able to sustain calm throughout Syria. My delegation reaffirms the importance to implement a Syrian-led and Syrian-owned political process facilitated by the United Nations in line with Resolution 2254 and that a broader process should respect and ultimately restore Syrian sovereignty, unity, and territorial integrity. Mr. President, I wish to particularly focus on the following points. First, the Syrian people need tangible progress on the ground, from ensuring the delivery of humanitarian assistance to all people in need, to enhancing the capacities of laboratories and, and testing kits of COVID-19, and from maintaining the ceasefire agreement to securing significant release of detainees, abductees, and missing persons. We urge all relevant parties to step up their efforts in this regard. Second, the agreed agenda of the Constitutional Committee must be respected by all Syrian parties. We are pleased that the agenda has been agreed upon and that it will serve as the basis of the next round of the Committee's meeting to be held in Geneva once international travel allows. As mentioned by Special Envoy Pedersen, we are also hopeful that the third session would be able to take place in the end of August. We are all aware that this is only the beginning of the process. However, this is a crucial step in order to advance to the next stage of the political track. And only with a constructive and substantive discussion based on trust and confidence among its members, then would the committee be able to reach its objective. Despite the fact that the problems being faced by a Syrian cannot be solely addressed by this discussion, as highlighted by Special Envoy, we should spare no effort in capitalizing all positive available momentum to open up every possible opportunity in ending the sufferings of the Syrian people. Third, the international community should work together, assist the Syrians to survive the dire economic situation. While Syrian's currency has plunged and prices of essential, of, of essential goods are increasing, the Syrian people is now facing food insecurity and major humanitarian needs are increasing across all sectors. 
The COVID-19 mitigation measures are also challenged in this particular condition. My delegation shares the Secretary General's call for the waiver of sanctions that can undermine the capacity of countries in ensuring access to food, health, and medical supplies in responding to the pandemic. After all, Mr. President, we must not lose faith in humanity. Mr. President, the risk of escalation in some areas in Syria is high, as reported by the special envoy. Indonesia urges all key parties to cease violence and avoid unnecessary actions that would put the Syrian people into a more dangerous situation. To conclude, Mr. President, I wish to reiterate my delegation's strong support to Special Envoy Pedersen's good offices in facilitating discussions among relevant stakeholders to implement Resolution 2254 and to give peace a chance in Syria. Je vous remercie, Monsieur le Président. Je remercie le représentant de l'Indonésie pour sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant de la Belgique. Merci, Monsieur le Président. I would like to start by thanking the Special Envoy for his briefing, um, as well as uh, Mrs. Uh, Noura Ghazi for uh, intervention and uh, powerful testimony. We continue to support the Special Envoy call for a nationwide ceasefire, for large-scale releases of detainees, and for the need for full humanitarian access. We welcome the relative calm in the northwest of the country since the Russian-Turkish ceasefire arrangements in the beginning of March. However, recent uh, Russian airstrikes and Syrian shelling illustrate the fragility of the situation. The risks for hundreds of thousands of vulnerable civilians in this region are enormous. We urge all parties to refrain from violence, reduce tension, and exercise maximum restraint. The UN should play a central role in the implementation of a nationwide ceasefire, as well as it's in monitoring. The war in Syria has now raged for over nine years. We've said it before so many times, and I repeat it to, today again, there is no military solution to this war. Meanwhile, the devastating effects of the economic collapse brought about by years of mismanagement and corruption are reverberating ever wider through Syria. The recent protests unfolding in Suwaida and elsewhere are a mere symptom of a far greater crisis striking at the heart of Damascus. Nine years of violence and brutal suppression have not led to the results the Syrian authorities had hoped for. Instead, it has left the country in shambles. Only a political solution can break the cycle of violence and put Syria back on track. The Constitutional Committee and the wider political process should urgently be reinvigorated and we fully support the Special Envoy's efforts as an important contribution to the UN facilitated political process mandated by Security Council Resolution 2254. And we urge those member states with influence over Damascus to urgently use it. Furthermore, any elections, including parliamentary elections, should be fair, transparent, and open to the members of the Syrian diaspora in order to constitute one step on the path to such a political solution. 
on the issue of political prisoners and missing persons that Mona uh, so um, clearly explained to us. So far, hardly any progress has been made. It is high time for Damascus to move beyond one-for-one -one prisoner exchanges and to release prisoners and information as an important confidence building measure. More than ever before, full humanitarian access must be ensured. Belgium as a humanitarian co holder together with Germany will continue its work toward the renewal of resolution 2165 concerning cross-border assistance. We urge all council members to be fully aware of the common responsibility that they bear, that we bear in this fight. We must shoulder this work together, guided solely by the humanitarian interests of the Syrian men, women, and children. <clears throat> At the end of this month, the fourth Brussels conference will take place. The EU and its member states are the most important humanitarian donor for Syria, having contributed over 17 billion euros since the beginning of the Syrian war. Yet, until this war is over and a political solution is well underway, we reconfirm our position that the, that the EU will not fund reconstruction. And to conclude, a few words about sanctions. The EU sanctions are targeted at those responsible for ordering and carrying out attacks and torture against their own people, making or using chemical weapons, or building their personal fortune on the war economy. They are carefully crafted to avoid any adverse humanitarian effects or unintended consequences for persons who are not targeted. Thank you. Je remercie le représentant de la Belgique pour sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant du Vietnam. I thank you, Mr. President. And I would like to thank Special Envoys Kate Pedersen and Ms. Nora Ghazi for their information. Mr. President, we are pleased to see that the mass fifth ceasefire agreement in the Northwest continues to be generally observed. Although certain challenges remain in this area as well as in different parts of Syria. In addition, the reappearance and resurgence of terrorist activities are troubled. We would like to reiterate our support for the appeals of the Secretary General and the Special Envoy for a nationwide ceasefire in Syria. We continue to urge all parties to heed this call to fight the COVID-19 pandemic in the most comprehensive manner and also to ensure stability in the country. Only when a sustainably calm situation on the ground is accused. Trust and confidence among concerned parties can be regained and an enabling environment can be created to accelerate the political process. Vietnam would like to take this opportunity to commend the consistent efforts of the special envoy to bring party together and look forward to the resumption of negotiation within the framework of the Constitutional Committee we consistently support the political solution for the Syrian as set, out, as set out in Resolution 2254, with full respect for the principle of sovereignty, equality, territorial integrity, non-interference in the internal affairs, and fully adheres to the national, to international laws and United Nations Charter. Mr. President, with the volatile socio-economic and humanitarian situation in Syria, 
with a new layer created by the COVID-19, is becoming extremely worrisome and putting greater pressures on the hardship of the Syrian people, including millions of internally displaced persons. Even though the number of confirmed cases remain relatively low, further risk of further spread of COVID-19 demands adequate attention to contain negative impact of the pandemic and the humanitarian situation on the people at present and in the long run. So while fighting the pandemic, we urge all concerned parties to, cre to create the most favorable condition for the continuation of essential humanitarian assistance. We also call on the international community to provide unwavering support for the Syrian people. Let us first now focus on saving and protecting life of innocent people. I thank you, Mr. President. Je remercie le représentant du Vietnam pour sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant de l'Afrique du Sud. We don't hear you, Jerry. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Apologies. I hope you can hear me now. Allow me to, to begin by thanking Special Envoy Gear Pedersen for his briefing and Ms. Nori Ghazi briefing has also duly been noted. The Syrian civil war has been raging for over nine years. Nine years in which thousands have died, been injured, and have been displaced. What has compounded this conflict, and no doubt prolonged it, has been the interference of outside role players, including foreign powers and armed groups. A peaceful, stable country became a battlefield for geopolitical rivalry and the ambitions of terrorist groups. As we reach the final stages of this conflict, the Syrian parties themselves, as well as all international role players, must commit to a peaceful settlement based on the commitment made during the roadmap agreed upon in Security Council Resolution 2254 of 2015. In this regard, Sarah calls all the parties to act towards a permanent ceasefire that will pave the way for an unbailing environment in which an inclusive Syrian-led dialogue can take place, aimed at achieving a lasting political solution reflective of the will of the people of Syria as a whole. As we move towards this process, there is an urgent need to address instability and tension in the north of Syria. Moreover, the presence of armed groups in the east pose an imminent threat to local and regional stability. We reiterate that peace cannot be achieved for as long as there is external interference support to armed groups in Syria. This must come to an end. The sovereignty, independence, and total integrity of Syria must be respected by all. Mr. President, the continued efforts of Special Envoy Gear Pedersen and his team in finding a lasting solution to end the conflict in Syria, despite the restrictions and challenges caused by COVID-19 pandemic must be supported. This council meets monthly to receive updates from the Special Envoy on progress made moving the parties towards peace. While we all commit in words to support the efforts to peace, this must be followed up by actions. Mr. President, we are encouraged about the report that the government and opposition sector of the Constitutional Committee have agreed to reconvene in August 2020 at the earliest, should the COVID-19 travel restriction be lifted. 
the convening of the Constitutional Committee, the resumptions of a vital political process. And as Mr. Pedersen has stated, it is necessary for building trust and confidence among the parties committed to this process. South Africa reiterates that the political and humanitarian tracks in Syria are interlinked and therefore we call on all stakeholders to promote progress in both tracks to ensure sustainable and peaceful settlement to the conflict. COVID-19 pandemic has affected all of us, developed and developing countries alike. However, its impact is exacerbated in countries affected by conflict. What is the council inability to adopt an outcome calling for global ceasefire in the time of the pandemic is unacceptable. We must at the very least support Special Envoy Pedersen's call for an immediate and nationwide cessation of hostilities in Syria and the Secretary General's call for the lifting of economic measures to ensure that Syria is fully able to respond to the virus. Syria remains at a high risk for the spread of this virus and all parties, Syrian government, social communities, NGOs and humanitarian agencies must do all in their part to contain the spread of the virus. This includes the continued safe and unpinned access of humanitarian aid and medical supplies to combat the virus and to ensure that all those who require assistance, wherever they are, whoever they are, receive it throughout Syria. All sides must be encouraged to undertake trust and confidence building measures. And these include progress in the release of civilian detained, particularly vulnerable groups such as women, children, the elderly, and those with disabilities. As part of these confidence building measures, promote progress, the easing of economic measures placed on Syria should be considered if there is progress on the political front. At the very least, Mr. President, humanitarian exemptions must be expedited and impediments for allowing these exemptions must be eased to ensure the delivery of supply. In conclusion, Sud Council Resolution 2254 2015 remains a roadmap for the political process in Syria when you call for its full implementation and for the Council's continued support of the work of the Constitutional Committee, the Special Envoy and his office and the various stakeholders participating in the mediation process. As we have seen by our own experience in South Africa, the only path to sustainable peace is through dialogue, negotiations and reconciliation. Today in South Africa, we commemorate the Youth Day, a day in which in 1976, 44 years ago, the youth of South Africa rose up against oppression and injustice. And Mr. President, someone delivering this statement now was among the youth of Soweto, who sparked the uprising in 1926 in South Africa. We remember the youth of Syria and elsewhere in the world have suffered for a long and continue to suffer even more today and deserve the right to live in peace and dignity and as citizens, as equal citizens of their homelands. I thank you, Mr. President. Je remercie le représentant de l'Afrique du Sud pour sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant de la Tunisie. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank uh, the UN Special Envoy for Syria, Mr. Peterson, for his uh, briefing, and I extend the warm welcome to Ambassador Bashar al-Jafari, permanent representative of Syria. Tunisia's support remains constant for Mr. Peterson's effort to promote the return of peace in Syria amid the COVID-19 pandemic. There have been some encouraging developments during the last quarter following the special envoy's call for a durable nationwide ceasefire. Remarkably, the last month registered the lowest civilian death toll since the start of the conflict. However, 
the overall political and security trends observed in Syria and across the wider region remain particularly worrisome. While the 6 March ceasefire in Idlib seems to have held and violence dropped in May, the pace for, of uh, recruiting Syrians to fight in Libya increased significantly the same month. This month witnessed a surge of violence in northwest Syria, which engendered renewed displacements in southern Idlib and northern Hahama, and reversed the recent returns of IDPs to their areas of origin. We are concerned about the political, about, sorry, about the potential breakdown on the ceasefire in light of the resumption of strikes along with reported military reinforcements on the ground in Idlib. Such developments undermine the political process on track as the Constitutional Committee discussion are slated for resumption in Geneva end of August. We call on parties to exercise utmost self-restraint and work together to sustain the truce. The Northwest, as much as the rest of Syria, cannot endure a new humanitarian catastrophe. We reiterate our support for a stepped-up role of the UN and its special envoy in mastering ceasefire initiatives in line with Security Council Resolution 2254 with a view to ensuring a nationwide and durable ceasefire in Syria. Mr. President, the activities of terrorist organizations, including Daesh, as well as Al-Qaeda affiliates, particularly Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, are yet another worrisome trend. Attacks carried out by Daesh have been on a steady rise for months now in Syria as well as in Iraq and require due attention of this council. Tunisia reiterates the need for collective counterterrorism effort to be marshaled for any solution to be to the conflict to take hold in the long run. We affirm that ceasefire remains a temporary relief until a joint and genuine solution is identified that addresses the threat of council-designated terrorist groups and erad eradicates the safe haven these groups have established in the region. Mr. President, the latest approval by Israel of a plan to build a new settlement in the Golan is a blatant move in the endless series of Israeli actions in systematic contempt of international law, international legal legality, and the international community. Tunisia reiterates that the Golan is a Syrian Arab territory occupied by Israel. We condemn this, the repeated and flagrant violation by Israel of the unity and dependence, territorial integrity and sovereignty of Syria on its territory, including the Golan territory. Such violations are contrary to the UN Charter, the principle of international law, and the relevant UN Security Council resolution, include, including Resolution 350, on the disengagement between the Israeli and Syrian sides and the resolution 497. Mr. President, let me finally reiterate that there is no military solution to the Syrian crisis. The only way forward is through a political solution in line with resolution 2254, a solution that ends the suffering of the Syrian people and safeguards Syria's sovereignty, unity, and dependence and territorial integrity. I thank you. Je remercie uh, le représentant de la Tunisie pour sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant de l'Allemagne. Merci, merci, Monsieur le Président. Um, I would like to start by briefly referring to what Mark, the Belgian ambassador, said at the very beginning with regard to the Syria conference and the end of the month in, uh, in Brussels, also what he said with regard to the cross-border resolution that we're going to be tabling together and which is inspired by the 
humanitarian needs and also what have been said um, um, by um, the threat of COVID-19 as, as Jerry just has highlighted it. Um, I would like to, to thank um, Gear Peterson for his um, briefing and I would like to extend a warm welcome to Noura Ghazi. Um, it is very difficult not to um, uh, become emotional and moved by what um, both um, briefers have said about the current situation in, um, in Syria. 80% live under a poverty line. Um, 10 million are food insecure and there is even a famine uh, threatening. And uh, we have to be very, very clear. Where does the responsibility for the financial and economic situation in Syria lie? It lies squarely with the regime. Um, instead of um, working with the population, reconstructing, continue to fight a war against the own population, bombing its own um, population, and this blame game to um, blame others for the, the uh, misfortune is just cynical. I'd like to remind um, colleagues that the EU is bearing the, um, the heaviest load with regard to humanitarian aid to the population of, of Syria. Um, since 2011, about 8 billion, um, um, 20 billion um, euros have been spent by the EU, 8 billion by alone by Germany for all the Syrian uh, refugees, which many have come to our, our country. Um, let me come back to what Noura Ghazi said. And um, uh, Nicola, thanks very much for inviting her to the briefing. Um, what she said really has to move us. The, the fate of women um, in, in the country. Um, women are always affected by um, conflict. And we see in Syria um, the worst example of what can, can happen to women. Um, women are violated whose husbands are murdered, um, tortured, uh, disappear, um, who um, are very often imprisoned, imprisoned with their children, gave birth, give birth to children in prisons, and as she said, um, in many cases cannot even um, bury their, their loved ones. And um, um, when, you, when you asked also um, just to have Syrian law applied, you know, you said you are not a traitor. I don't consider you a traitor. I consider you a patriot who wants to have um, a, a prosperous Syria. And um, the Syrian, um, even Syrian law applied, which does not allow for torture and summary executions. Um, let me um, concentrate a bit on, on one issue which we find uh, extremely important. And we at the Security Council just last week until yesterday looked at, and this is accountability. I still have um, in my ear what um, our colleague from Iraq yesterday said about the need for accountability. Um, we need accountability because this is the only, the only way how wounds can heal. And therefore, we have to work on, on, on accountability. Um, now, um, um, Kelly mentioned the CESAR Act. Um, and the CESAR Act, they are heavy sanctions, but it is called after Caesar, Caesar the photographer, who is the, um, the witness of um, the horrible crimes committed in Assad's uh, prison. I brought you pictures from Caesar in a previous, um, in a previous uh, session. And um, we um, are in Germany now, um, actually have the first perpetrators of um, war crimes in front of German courts, and uh, much, much more has to be, has to be done. We have seen these last days that is possible. We, finally, um, the, the, um, one of the perpetrators of the Rwanda genocide was found. And um, uh, uh, yesterday, the International Criminal Court ha heard, um, had for the first time meeting one of the, um, one of the people responsible for the genocide in, in Darfur, which I think is a fantastic signal to the victims. And in this context, um, I must say, I very much regret that uh, the U.S. is so um, opposed against the International Criminal Court, a court which we see very, very important and actually in um, also the um, um, uh, historic consequence of the, of the Nuremberg trials. Um, let me go back to, um, to also um, accountability and um, also briefly to what uh, Vasili said. Um, 
I still don't understand why the Russian Federation is continuing to, find, uh, to, to fight accountability, while it's continued to be working against the OPCW, while it's continued to be against Triple IM, um, all fact-finding mission always against this, and um, uh, covering up all the um, crimes that have been committed, and uh, um, now by saying that all the findings about um, Russian uh, misbehavior and bombing of hospitals are false. Well, let's go and, and go in front of the courts and see and then go in front of the court and see what um, the facts are about this. So let me end again by appealing to the Syrian regime, stop bombing your own population, um, free the, the many uh, detainees, um, engage in, in serious political talks. I mean, when I hear that this um, constitutional committee is supposed to, to meet again at the end of August. I mean, what is this? I mean, we have a serious crisis. Uh, millions of people are suffering. This, co this constitutional committee should meet by virtual means as we are meeting and they should meet tomorrow and not at the end of August. Um, why, why doesn't this happen? I mean, um, we are just watching and not pushing the parties to, to get earlier and, and talk about um, the future of the, of the country. Um, we have seen a lot of infighting now within the Syrian regime, which is breaking apart. We mentioned the prime minister being sacked, and we hear now, um, I asked about this, and uh, you can read about this in the New York Times today, about infighting within the family where Assad's first cousin, um, Rami Makhlouf, um, is now um, uh, taking all the, the, the money that, that he has accumulated um, by whatever means so that people can be can be um, paid. This is the end of a regime. We have to come back to reconciliation in this country and we cannot allow the continuation of the suffering of millions of people. Thank you. Je remercie le représentant de l'Allemagne pour sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant de l'Estonie. Merci, Monsieur le Président. I would first like to thank Special Envoy Pedersen and Ms. Noura Ghazi for their briefing. Looking at Northwest Syria, we express growing concern about the recent ceasefire violations and military buildup of the Syrian army around Idlib. In order to avoid civilian casualties and another wave of mass displacement, preventing military escalation must remain council priority. Continued fighting in Idlib area might also accelerate the spread of COVID-19 as it limits the work of humanitarian aid organizations. It is unfortunate that on the political process, we hear little new development. We call on the parties to set a date for the meeting of the Constitutional Committee as soon as possible. We reiterate the need to implement the Security Council Resolution 2254. The plan of the Syrian regime to hold parliamentary elections in July is in clear violation of the roadmap set out in that resolution. Credible and inclusive political process must be in place before any such actions. As described by Ms. Ghazi, an important step towards national reconciliation is solving the situation of detainees in Syria. We call on the Syrian government to abide by the international human rights law and relevant Security Council resolutions, including Resolution 2139, and to release immediately all arbitrarily detained persons, particularly women and children. Forced disappearances must stop. Unfortunately, past announcements of general amnesties have not led to any significant releases of, of arbitrarily detained Syrians. We remind the Syrian government and its allies that the European Union will not provide aid to Syria's reconstruction before a genuine political process is in place. I would also like to stress that the current economic crisis in Syria 
is not the outcome of international sanctions, but rather a result of widespread corruption and lack of good governance. The difficult economic situation in neighboring Lebanon also greatly affects Syria. Finally, these points will be repeated in two weeks during the fourth Brussels conference to support the future of Syria convened by the EU. We welcome an inspiring video conference on accountability for crimes committed in Syria, which the, the EU held within the framework of this conference on the 8th of June in Geneva. Participants included EU member states, human rights activists, IIIM, OPCW, Commission of Inquiry and others trying to shed light on Syrian rights violations and bring perpetrators to justice. The Security Council should also consider this kind of holistic approach to accountability. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je remercie euh, le représentant de l'Estonie euh, pour sa déclaration et je vais maintenant faire une déclaration en ma qualité de représentant de la France. Je tiens à remercier M. Peterson et Mme Khazi pour leur présentation. Plus de 100 000 personnes en Syrie croupissent dans les prisons du régime. La dernière amnistie annoncée par le régime est un simulacre. L'absence d'avancée sur la question des disparus demeure également une des principales sources de souffrance pour le peuple syrien. Ce Conseil doit s'unir en réponse à l'appel de l'envoyé spécial à libérer les prisonniers et à faciliter l'accès aux centres de détention. Il est urgent de sortir de la logique d'échange de prisonniers en cours. Le moment est venu de travailler un processus politique plus large qui réponde aux attentes de la société civile. Le blocage des travaux du comité constitutionnel huit mois après sa création est consternant. Après des mois d'obstruction dont le régime porte seul la responsabilité, il est urgent que les discussions avec l'envoyé spécial reprennent pour préparer une réunion à Genève dans les meilleurs délais. La répression des manifestations dans le sud du pays ces dernières semaines par le régime est également la preuve qu'il continue d'opposer des solutions répressives à des problèmes politiques. Face à l'instabilité partout en Syrie et le Covid-19, la priorité doit aller à la mise en place d'un cessez-le-feu complet à l'échelle nationale sous la supervision des Nations Unies en réponse à l'appel du secrétaire général et son, de son envoyé spécial. Dans le nord-ouest, la trêve russo-turque reste fragile. La lutte contre les groupes terroristes ne peut servir de prétexte à la reprise d'une offensive par le régime et ses alliés, ni des violations du droit international humanitaire. Au nord-ouest, tout comme au nord-est, l'aide humanitaire doit parvenir aux populations dans le besoin. Dans ce contexte, le mécanisme transfrontalier reste irremplaçable. La France continuera de se mobiliser avec ses partenaires pour lutter contre la résurgence de Daesh dans le centre du péril. Enfin, l'instabilité et la grave crise économique que traverse la Syrie soulignent l'urgence d'une solution politique. Le marasme économique en Syrie est le fruit de la corruption chronique et du jusqu'au boutisme du régime. Les sanctions européennes visent des individus et des entités qui participent à la répression et profitent des retombées du conflit. Elles sont assorties de dispositifs permettant de préserver l'accès humanitaire. L'Union européenne fait partie des principaux contributeurs d'aide humanitaire, y compris dans les zones sous le contrôle du régime. Parce que c'est le seul moyen de permettre un retour de la stabilité en Syrie, j'appelle l'envoyé spécial à travailler un processus politique élargi à tous les éléments de la résolution 2254, mise en œuvre de mesures de confiance pour créer un environnement sûr et neutre, préparation d'élections libres et transparentes sous la supervision des Nations Unies auxquelles les Syriens de la diaspora participeront. Des élections qui ne répondraient pas aux critères fixés par la résolution 2254 ne pourraient en aucun cas être reconnues comme légitimes par ce Conseil. Enfin, 
Tant qu'un processus politique crédible n'est pas fermement engagé, la France et l'Union européenne ne financeront pas la reconstruction en Syrie. I would like to thank Mr. Peterson and Mrs. Hazi for their presentations. More than 100,000 people in Syria are today imprisoned in the regime's jails. The latest amnesty announced by the regime cannot be taken seriously. The lack of progress on the issue of the disappeared persons uh, also remains one of the main sources of suffering for the Syrian people. This council must unite in response to the special envoy's call to release prisoners and facilitate access to detention centers. It is urgent to move beyond the current prisoner exchange logic. Time has come to work on a broader political process that meets the expectation of the Syrian civil society. The paralysis of the work of the Constitutional Committee, eight months after its creation, is appealing. After months of obstructions for which the regimes bear sole responsibility, it is urgent that discussions with the special envoy resume to prepare a meeting in Geneva as soon as possible. The regime's repression of protests in the south of the country in recent weeks also clearly shows that it continues to propose repressive solutions to political problems. In the face of instability and COVID-19, the priority must be to establish a comprehensive nationwide ceasefire under UN supervision in response to the appeal of the Secretary General and his special envoy. In the Northwest, the Russian-Turkish truth agreement remains fragile. The fight against terrorist groups cannot justify the resumption of an offensive by the regime and its allies, nor violations of international law. In both the Northwest and Northeast, humanitarian aid must reach people in need. In this context, the cross-border mechanism remains irreplaceable. France will continue with its partners to combat the resurgence of Daesh in the center of the country. Finally, the instability and serious economic crisis in Syria underscores the urgency of a political solution. The economic crisis in Syria is the result of chronic corruption and of the regime's refusal to compromise. European sanctions are focused on individuals and entities that participate in the repression and profit from the war economy. Sanctions also have mechanisms to safeguard humanitarian access. The European Union is among the main contributors of humanitarian assistance including in the zone control, in the regime controlled areas. Because it's the only way to bring back stability, I call on the special envoy to work on a political process that encompasses all elements of resolution 2254, implementation of confidence building measures to create a secure and neutral environment, preparation of free and fair elections, under UN supervision to which the Syrian diaspora participates. Elections that do not meet the criteria set out in resolution 2254 could in no way be recognized as legitimate by this council. Finally, until a credible political process is not firmly underway, France and the European Union will not finance reconstructions in Syria. Je reprends mes fonctions de président du Conseil et je donne maintenant la parole aux représentants de la République arabe syrienne. Merci bien, Monsieur le Président. Et je remercie aussi mon cher ami, l'envoyé spécial, Monsieur Guy Peterson, pour sa présence et sa participation. Mr. President, when the United States steals openly 200,000 oil barrels from the Syrian oil fields on a daily basis, 
and when it also steals 400,000 tons of cotton and sets fire to thousands of hectares of wheat fields. And when it steals 5 million livestock, bragging about dividing Syria and deliberately weakening the value of the Syrian pound. When the United States imposes economic coercive measures aiming at suffocating the Syrian people. When the United States occupies parts of my country and protects its Turkish partner that occupies other swath of territories of Syria. When my colleague, the permanent representative of the United States, however, talks about her administration concern of the deteriorated situation, living situation of the Syrian citizens, attributing such deterioration to what she calls the regime, then the legitimate question here becomes the following. Does that not indicate an acute illness situation? Aren't these the symptoms of political schizophrenia? On May 31st, 2020, my country submitted a formal complaint to the Secretary General of the United Nations and the President of the Security Council against some of the governments of member states, at the forefront of which are the United States, the UK, France and Turkey. Over the past nine years, the governments of those countries have supported, financed, and armed multinational terrorist organizations and groups with multiple loyalties and labels and separatist proxy militias. Furthermore, they have deliberately, militarily intervened in my country through unilateral and tripartite acts of aggression, the occupation of parts of, my, of Syrian territory, the commission of murder, destruction, displacement, and demographic change, the looting of natural and historical resources and riches, including oil, gas, and antiquities and agricultural crops, burning and destroying what they cannot steal, and imposing more unilateral coercive economic measures on the Syrian people. These practices and the gross violations of the principles of international law and the provisions of the Charter of the United Nations highlight a contradiction in these governments' vision of multilateral international action and a return to the perspective of the League of Nations, which, as we all know, legitimized aggression and occupation, dooming itself to failure. These practices are blatant attempts at the destructive intervention in the political process facilitated by the United Nations through the special envoy of the Secretary General with the aim of diverting it from a path based on the Syrian-Syrian national dialogue with Syrian ownership and leadership to a form of imposition of these countries' will and dictates on the United Nations at the expense of the Syria's sovereignty, natural resources, and well-being, and the security of its own people. Mr. President, in light of the statements we just heard, I find myself obligated to clarify a few concepts. The policies of blockade and imposition of unilateral coercive measures have been and continue to be an integral part of the blind, prejudiced Western policies and the other side of terrorism that has reaped the lives of Syrians and destroyed their achievements, harming the Syrian people through targeting their national currency, medicine and livelihood and the obstruction of the ability of state institutions to meet their basic needs and continue to provide public services, 
denies any Western claims of a humanitarian concern. The latest example of the, of the attempt to harm the Syrian people is manifested in the burning of humanitarian food shipments by some Lebanese parties. These shipments have been regularly provided by the World Food Programme to the Syrians in need through the Lebanese territories for years. The United States administration and the European Union have flouted all international demands for putting an end to the unilateral coercive measures imposed on the Syrian people, including the calls of the Secretary General and his special envoy to Syria, and their renewal and intensification of the effects of those measures. In parallel with the entry into force of the so-called Caesar Act of the United States, all of the above represent a disregard of the American administration and the European Union for all the achievements of humanity accumulated in the field of international law and an attempt to impose American and European law on the world. James Jeffrey's recent statement represents an explicit recognition by the U.S. administration of its direct responsibility for the suffering of Syrians. Such an irresponsible statement reaffirms that the administration views the region with Israeli eyes because the demands that Jeffrey is talking about are renewed. Old Israeli demands aimed at at shaping the region in a way that achieves its hegemonic agenda. Maintaining international peace and security, which the three permanent Western members of the Security Council are supposed to be particularly interested with, is not in line with the way these same countries and other Western governments, as well as their tools, turn a blind eye to the practices of their NATO ally, Turkey, for their fully adopt and defend its crimes in Syria, Libya, and other countries. It is also inconsistent with with ignoring the American-Turkish occupation of parts of my country, shamelessly sponsoring terrorism and separatist militias there, and holding meetings between representatives of the governments of these two countries and terrorist organizations on the soul of my country. This was recently demonstrated by the infiltration of the Turkish defense and interior ministers into the Syrian territory of the Syrian governorate of Idlib. They have taken advantage of the calm period that prevailed after Moscow agreement to reinforce the presence of the Turkish occupation forces and their affiliated terrorist groups operating in that area. Moreover, the Turkish regime is currently seeking to replace the Syrian national currency with the Turkish currency in the areas it occupies in Syria. It also persists in its attempt at the Turkification of these areas. Here, Erdogan's forces are identical to Israel's in their occupation of territories from my country, namely speaking the Golan, the Syrian Golan. The Turkish and Israeli occupations are complementary and harmonious in serving their American operator. Further, maintaining international peace and security is not in line with the the resolve of the the three permanent Western member states and the Security Council not to eliminate the terrorist organization of ISIS as they mobilize its remnants in Iraq and Syria whenever the interests of these states require. In my statement delivered on May the 19th, 2020, I referred to confessions of ISIS terrorists captured by the Syrian Arab army, in which they stressed the fact that they were trained by the American occupation forces in the Syrian-occupied region of al Tanf. Recently, an ISIS terrorist named Mohammed Hussein Saoud confessed that the British intelligence forced, forced him, along with other terrorists, to work for it and tasked them to gather information on Syrian and Russian 
military locations and institutions in Syria. Mr. President, in its official complaint, my country requested the Secretary General and the Security Council to put an end to the hostile foreign interventions in the domestic affairs of my country, as well as to commit all member states to refrain from any practices aiming at undermining the independence and course of the political process, affecting the interests and the choices of the Syrian people, the safety and stability of Syria as well as its regional and international relations. Furthermore, Syria requested the Secretary General to mandate the specialized legal organs in the Secretariat to prepare an immediate report on how the American and European laws and legislations of imposing an economic embargo on the Syrian people are in line with the provisions of the Charter and related Security Council resolutions on Syria. This report should also highlight the catastrophic impact of those measures on the lives of the Syrian people. My country, ladies and gentlemen, looks forward to the response of the Secretary General to this request and to be informed as soon as possible of what procedures are taken along with, this, with his mandate and capacity in facilitating the political process in the Syrian Arab Republic. Finally, Mr. President, we have always been a victim of settling Western scores. Therefore, we are good readers of history. The, hist the problem with our enemies and rivals is, is that we read history differently. In this regard, it would be suitable to recall what a wise social politician once said, I quote, only fools defy history, unquote. I would like to say to my colleagues, representatives of the Western countries in this council, lift your pressures off my country, Syria. Let the Syrian people breathe. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je remercie euh, le représentant de la République arabe syrienne euh, pour sa déclaration. Euh, nous voici arrivés au terme de la partie euh, publique de cette, euh, la partie de cette séance diffusée en direct, la partie publique. Euh, cette partie de la réunion est terminée et les membres du Conseil restent et passent maintenant en consultation privée.